At the end of the 19th century, David Hilbert, who was a famous mathematician at the time, listed 20 problems that he thought were going to direct the future of 20th century mathematics. But one of them, Hilbert's third problem, was so easy that Hilbert's student solved it two years after he posed it. So that's the one I want to explain today. Yeah, I would call it Hilbert's third problem, but it's maybe, maybe let's call it the equidecomposability problem. If you have two polygons, P1 and P2, so no rules about convex or concave? No rules about convex or concave. All you need is uh, a finite number of straight lines which meet and form a closed figure. So here's two polygons, P1 and P2, and they have the same area. Then you can cut up P1 with finitely many straight lines and rearrange the pieces to get P2. So here's an example of a polygon which I've already pre-cut. It's a parallelogram. And here's how you can rearrange it into a rectangle with the same area. You just move this triangle over here. So that was pretty easy. So the proof actually gives you an algorithm for cutting up a polygon and, and uh, decomposing it into another one. So Hilbert's third question, which was in 1898, I think, was, is the same thing true in three dimensions? So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you have two polyhedra, so three-dimensional figures, which are made out of you know, flat faces, edges, and vertices, and if they have the same volume, can you cut one up into pieces with finitely many cuts? and rearrange the pieces to make the other. I mean, my intuition would be yes, because if you put two polyhedra with the same volume into like a bath, they'll displace the same amount of water, so. Yeah, so if you were allowed to melt the polyhedra, you could definitely do it. Uh, but if you're only allowed to use straight cuts, it turns out you can't, and this is what Dane proved. And I think Hilbert probably expected this, so I think he probably tried with a cube, tried to cut it up into pieces and rearrange it into a tetrahedron, so that's a, a figure with four faces, all of which are triangles, which are the same. And he couldn't do it, and so the actual question was, can you cut up a cube with finitely many knife cuts and rearrange the pieces to get a tetrahedron? And Dane ended up proving that you can't do that. You can't do it. You can't do it. What changes between two and three dimensions that suddenly makes it impossible? Yeah, so, so I can explain at least the idea behind Dane's proof. Dane was the student of, of Hilbert, and it was his thesis problem to, to solve Hilbert's third question. It's one of the greatest theses of all time. And so, so what was his idea? Well, his idea was that, well, let's say you have two polygons which have a different area. Why can't you cut one up and, and rearrange it to the other? Well, the area is an invariant under this action of cutting it and then moving the pieces around. The area doesn't change. So Dane's idea was that you should find some invariant of a polyhedron that doesn't change when you cut it up and move the pieces around. And then he wanted to compute that invariant for the cube and for the tetrahedron and see if they're different. So what that means is that uh, you know, no matter how you take the cube, cut it up, and move the pieces around, if these invariants are different, you can't get a tetrahedron that way. The deal breaker, the thing that, the thing yeah, the, that can't change. The obstruction, yeah, to, to, to move, changing one piece, into one, one polyhedron into another polyhedron. What was that? What, are you going to tell yeah, me? I'll tell you. It's kind of, it's kind of complicated. So, so we should, uh, maybe we should build up to it. Let's prove this 1833 theorem. So this is equidecomposability for polygons. All right, so there are several steps. So what's the goal? Let me first make the problem a little bit easier. Let's try to cut up a polygon of area A, so A could be 5, and rearrange the pieces into a 1 by A rectangle. And I claim that's enough. Why is that? It's because cutting something up and rearranging the pieces is a reversible operation. So if you have a polygon of area A, you can make it into a 1 by A rectangle. And another polygon of area A, you can make it into the same 1 by A rectangle. And then, well, how do you get from your first polygon to your second one? You just pass through the 1 by A rectangle that you are able to make both of them into. So it's enough to do this. So we can assume 1 of P1 and P2 is just a rectangle. So what's the first step? It's easy. You just cut it into triangles. Step 2 is a little trickier. We're going to turn triangles into parallelograms. All right, so we have our triangle. What do we do? We take the midpoints of these two sides, we draw the line through them so that this has the same length as this, and then, well, we just move this triangle over here. So here's a triangle, and now you can cut it up and turn it into a parallelogram. So any triangle can be paralle parallelogramized. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, now we're going to turn parallelograms into rectangles. So here, what do you do? You just drop a perpendicular like this, and then move this triangle over here. Here's my parallelogram, and I'm gonna turn it into a rectangle. All right. Yeah, that was easy. All right, so now we have some rectangle, which has the same area as our original polygon. Well, we do this for every triangle we got, and we get a bunch of rectangles. And now we're gonna make it into a one by a rectangle. And so here's 
some rectangle. And what we do is we measure out a distance one, let's say one inch or so from the bottom, and draw a rectangle with the same area. And now we connect these two vertices. And it turns out that the triangle ABC is the same, it's congruent to the triangle DEF. So we can start by moving this triangle and just sliding it down here. Now there's a little bit left over, it's these two triangles, and it turns out they're also the same. And it turns out the triangle ADG is the same as the triangle CFH. How do we cut this rectangle up into this one, which has the desired property? It's a one by the area rectangle. We just move this triangle over here and this triangle over here. Okay, and that finishes the proof. We first cut into triangles, then we cut into parallelograms, then we cut into rectangles, then we cut into special rectangles. And then we undo all of that to get into the other polygon that we wanted to, to aim at at the beginning. Cool. Okay. So, so uh, why did this work? It worked because we had this one invariant that we knew to search for, the area. Right, we were going to search for a 1 by A rectangle. And it turns out that there's a secret hidden invariant in three dimensions that will stop us from running this uh, algorithm. All right, so let's, uh, let's see what Dane did. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to take a cube and a tetrahedron, which have the same volume. And he wanted to show you couldn't cut this up in any way with a finite number of slices and rearrange the pieces to get this one. So he had to come up with some way of distinguishing the two, something that is different about these guys which doesn't change when you cut them up and rearrange the pieces. Daniel, you're saying he wanted to show you couldn't do it. That's right. Wouldn't he rather have shown you could do it? Or well, did, he, did he already know? He probably tried. I mean, uh, yeah, so why, why do you conjecture something's impossible? You like try really hard and try really hard and you just fail and you get really frustrated and you're like, I'm gonna prove this can't be done. <laughs> and in Dane's case, he was able to do it. So here's the basic observation. So let's zoom in on some edge of a polyhedron. And there's two invariants of this edge you can look at. You can look at the length, so L is the length of an edge. And there's another invariant, which I'll call theta. That's the dihedral angles. It's the angle it takes to get from this face to this one. So it's the angle swept out by my hands as I move from one face to the other. It's the angle it takes to get from this face to this one. So, so that's some angle between zero and two pi. So what's the observation? The observation is there's two ways to cut. So one is you can cut like this. So you can cut with a plane that kind of passes through the edge. It cuts this edge in half, right? Changes the length. It changes the length, but it leaves the dihedral angle the same, right? And the lengths of the two edges you get are the, they sum to the original length. So if you cut, let's say vertically, you get L1 theta and L2 theta. So the two lengths of these two pieces, L1 and that's L2. The thetas are the same and L1 plus L2 is the original length. Right, so the other thing you can do is cut along the edge. So the other thing you can do is cut like this. And then you get, well, two edges. They're on these two pieces. They have the same length and the angles sum together. So you get L theta 1 and L theta 2. Uh, and here the theta 1 plus theta 2 is the original theta. So the two dihedral angles add together to give you what you started with. And so Dane's idea was to stare at this and just make it into an invariant in the most brutal way possible. So how did he do it? So here's the invariant. So you take the sum of the following symbols, Li tensor theta i, where here this runs over the edges of the polyhedron. So what you do is you take the length of each edge and the angle at each edge and write down just this sum, which is right now just a sum of symbols. It doesn't mean anything. So let's figure out what it means. Yeah, how, to, how do you add an angle to a length? That's right, it doesn't, well, so we're sort of, we're formally multiplying them, and then we're adding these symbols together. So let me, let me say what, where this lives. So this lives in something, which is called the real numbers tensored with the real numbers mod two pi. So let me explain what this set is. You're cracking out the new symbols on me now. That's right, <laughs> yeah. So let's say what this is. So an element of this thing, this weird object is just a sum a1 tensor b1 plus a2 tensor b2. These are just symbols so far, all the way up to a n tensor b n for some n, where these a i and b i are just real numbers. But we say two symbols like this are the same if certain rules are satisfied. So what rules? Well, first of all, a tensor b is the same as a tensor b plus 2 pi. What is this expressing? It's just expressing that if you take an angle and you add 2 pi to it, you get the same angle. All right, now we have some other rules. We say that a1 
tensor B plus A2 tensor B is the same as A1 plus A2 tensor B. So you're allowed to add on the left if the b's on the right are the same. So what does this express? It expresses that if you have two thetas which are the same, if you cut, you can add the lengths. That's just expressing this. All right, there's one more rule. It's just the same thing on the other side. So it says that if you have a tensor b1 plus a tensor b2, that's the same as a tensor b1 plus b2. And that's just expressing this rule. So this is just a set of symbols which you're allowed to add and subtract but they follow some funny rules when you do that. And Dane's invariant is this object inside this set. And he's saying, well, no matter how you cut up your shape, when you compute this invariant, you get the same thing in this set. That's called the Dane invariant. I'm not gonna to pretend to totally understand it, but I believe you. Uh -huh. What's wrong with having an invariant though? Why does that mean I can't just, you know, be strategic and make millions of cuts and still be able to build these things. Yeah, so the point of this invariant is that it doesn't change when you make a cut, right? You get more edges and you get more angles, but because of these rules over here, and equivalently these rules over here, the invariant in the set just doesn't change. So now what you have to do is, given to a polyhedron, you have to compute this invariant. And sometimes they're different, right? So Dane's observation showed that the invariant of the cube is not the same as the invariant of the tetrahedron. So this invariant is almost like a, like a fingerprint or DNA. It's, That's exactly right. It's unique to the polyhedron. Yeah, so, so it turns out, and Dane didn't know this, but it was proven about 30 years later, that if you know the volume of a, of a polyhedron and you know the Dane invariant, then that determines the polyhedron up to this operation of cutting and moving the pieces around. So in fact, it's true that if you have two polyhedra with the same volume and the same Dane invariant, then you can cut one up and get the other one by rearranging the pieces. But here, Dane, what Dane did is just showed that he, if you have two polyhedra with different invariants, you just can't do that. You're stuck. There's no way you can change the Dane invariant. Because once you've got a Dane invariant, you, you're stuck with it for life. That's right, yeah. There's nothing you can do, at least with this operation of cutting with a knife and moving the pieces around that changes that invariant. That's why it's called an invariant. What's the Dane invariant of a cube? Is it like yeah, seven so we can, or something? Yeah, so we can do the Dane invariant of a cube. That's a good example. So let's, let's do the cube. So luckily all the edges are the same. So we only have to compute with one edge. So let's say we have a cube of side length one. And then what do we have to do? We have to compute the angle. Well, that's just 90 degrees or a pi over two. So for each edge contributes one tensor pi over two. And then how many edges are there? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12. And well, because of this rule, that if the second guys are the same, we can add the first guys, this is just the same as 12 tensor pi over two, if you'd like. So that's the Dane invariant of the cube. Now the tetrahedron is a little harder. Well, you compute this angle, which I'll just call theta. It's a little bit of a pain to compute it, so I won't do it here. You have to compute what side length gives you a volume of one, so let's call it L. And how many edges are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six. So you get six times L, tensor theta. And once you compute what these actually are, you'll see that it isn't the same as this. So if I gave you a cube and said, turn this into a tetrahedra, yeah. you're going to say, yeah, I, I can do that. But unfortunately, I'm going to have to change this volume. Uh, no, unfortunately, you have to do both the volume and the Dane invariant. Oh, you have to change same, both. Right? Because of course, the volume doesn't change when you cut and move things around either. Oh. So th those are exactly the two invariants of a polyhedron, the volume and the Dane invariant. Dane's big contribution was to discover that this is, there is the second one. Nobody knew that before. How come I can do it when I melt them? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's because melting them doesn't change the volume, right? But it does change this invariant. You've destroyed all the edges, so how would you even compute the Dane invariant? In fact, it turns out in higher dimensions, there are also even more invariants. We don't know what they are in general. So that's an open problem if you want to think about, uh, I don't know, 12-dimensional polyhedra and when you can cut one up and get the other one. It's actually a really beautiful and exciting part of mathematics. There, there's a little bit of complicated mathematics there, Art. That's right. But I can still appreciate what Dane did, the cleverness of it, that he found, that he realized those edges were the problem. Yeah. It was clever. Yeah. Well, I think the really amazing thing is he knew, well, the lengths of the edges don't stay the same and the dihedral angles don't stay, stay the same when you cut things up but there's some funny way of combining them all together that does stay the same, and that's really the miracle of the Dane invariant.
Clever. Yeah. Good thesis. Yeah. I bet there was no, no, no questioning about giving him his doctorate. Yeah, I mean, he went on to do a lot of amazing stuff in the rest of mathematics, too. But yeah, this was an amazing start. <laughs> cool. Turn them away because the hotel's full. But the manager's clever. And here's what he does. He shifts the person in room one to room two, and the person in room two to room three, and the person in room three to room four, and so on. Everyone gets shifted forward one room. And because there's infinitely many rooms, you never run out of rooms to put people in.